All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon for what is the fifth and final lecture of our webinar series with the Rogo Cancer Center as part of the Rogo Cancer Center's innovation program. Uh, more on our speaker in a second. I just have a few words to get through and um, I'll turn things over to him. Remember, please keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question today. Um, you can use the chat feature if you'd like to submit a question or you can ask uh, a question um, by unmuting yourself when the time is, is right. Our staff will be monitoring that chat feature. We'll share some links and some resources when appropriate. And we are recording the lecture today and making the slides available to you uh, again, post-program. I know they were sent um, in advance of today's webinar, but we'll send them again post-program by, by email so you have a copy of, of those slides. Um, the the Rogo Cancer Center Innovation Program, reminder, is a two-part program with this webinar series and a project-based course. Since we are finishing the, the fifth of five lectures today, I'm not going to speak much to that, but I will mention that there are some uh, openings that remain in the project-based course. So if you are working on a oncology-based therapeutic and you'd like to meet with our, our network of mentors uh, and guides uh, over about a five to eight week period starting in, in, in March 8th, um, please go to our website or send Catherine or I an email. We can get you involved in that project-based course. So today uh, we're joined by Dr. Stephen Eck, who you can see on the right-hand side of your screen has just a uh, wealth of experience uh, in this space. Um, he requested that I keep my comments brief about him. So that's all I'll say and turn things over to uh, Dr. Stephen Eck to explain more. Okay, I need to, you need to enable screen sharing so I can see, so I can share my slides. I'll just say I'm glad to see Stevens wearing the block M today. <laughs> okay, hopefully you can see my slides. If you yes, can't, if you can't let me know. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you guys today. Um, I have the uh, distinction of covering all of clinical development in one hour. Um, that's a lot of material. Um, so I'm gonna go pretty quickly. I'll tell you up front that I, this is not entirely comprehensive. I've been, um, I've sort of cherry picked the topics uh, and examples I like. There's a wealth of information out there uh, and I will try to give you some good references to steer to, to um, other further reading you can do along the way. Um, I should note that these are, these are my opinions. They're not the opinion of macrogenics or any of the companies with which I'm affiliated. You're also free to use the slides for anything you like. I don't own, I have any claim to them. I have, um, I have had a very uh, interesting and fun career spanning pretty much every aspect of drug development. I've been in some aspect of drug development now for close to 40 years, uh, starting both in, as a basic scientist, working in drug discovery, target discovery, later on the medical side, um, spent quite a bit of time at Michigan and then at Penn. Um, I wrote my first IND, my second IND at Penn, um, and then I went into large pharmaceutical companies and more recently in biotech companies. I had the privilege of working on a number of drugs that have gotten approved. Over this period of time, I've seen a lot of things change in the field. It's gonna to continue to change. Um, there's some things that are sort of constant, um, but this is a very nuanced and detailed um, area. So some of my comments are rather general and, and they may not necessarily apply to another situation. Uh, and just a comment on my affiliations and uh, potential conflict of interests. Um, I sit on a number of board of directors, both private and public companies, as well as not-for-profits. And I've, and I've founded one company along the way, along, along with another Michigan graduate. Mike Clark. So this is a brief outline for the course. I'm gonna spend the first half just getting us through phase one designs. I think those are somewhat most challenging and probably what you're gonna be most faced with. Usually by the time you're in phase two or phase three, that's really more corporate work unless you're working with a cooperative group. I'll say up front that my, my views and comments here are largely from the perspective of commercial drug development, which may not be entirely um, 
appropriate for academic considerations. There are many clinical trials that are done, not necessarily for the purpose of drug approval, and um, there's a lot of variations on those themes. But I'm pretty much focused on how do you go from a good idea to getting your drug approved. And so that's my frame of reference. And, and, and you can that will become immediately apparent. The first thing I'd like to point out is the way that drugs are discovered and developed today is relatively new. Um, drug, you know, people have been doing drug development for quite some time. Cancer drug development is relatively new, really post-World War II. Um, but the way in which it was done prior to 2000, more or less, uh, was distinctly different than how it's done now. The entire focus now is on understand the biology of disease. You understand the biology of a migraine, you understand the bi biology of Walters and macroglobulinemia, whatever your target indication is, you have some biologic understanding and that's your hook. That's where you start. We don't do phenotypic discovery much anymore. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's been very useful. That's how we got aspirin. That's how we got alkylating agents. Uh, there are a lot of good drugs that came through phenotypic discovery. But now we start with something that drugs prior to 2000 really didn't have. And that was how do they w actually work? And many times we don't actually know. We start with a principle, um, but uh, we, we discover more about the drug along the way. Pavlocyclobe is a good example. It is an inhibitor of uh, cyclin dependent kinase four and six uh, and, and stops cell cycle. But it also regulates gluconeogenesis, which a fun fact you might not have known. And how that impacts its activity at, in clinical use in breast cancer it's not entirely clear, but we often find out that drugs have other activities beyond what we intended to do, even if they're doing what we intended them to do in patients. So if you don't have a good target and you don't have good chemical matter, you're not gonna be successful um, in the modern environment. This is really foundational. The discovery part is, is foundational to everything we do now. So I put together this little graphic to give you some idea of how we look at this in, in, uh, from an entirely commercial perspective. We start with this, uh, the belief that there's some mechanism of action. And that, and that if we had a well-behaved molecule that interacted with this mechanism of action, we'd have a good drug. And that was to be true because biochemistry, um, pharm pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and clinical activity are related. We take that as a given. That turns out not always to be true, but that is our usual starting point. Um, in early development, we start with the notion that the drugs don't work. Now everyone wants their drug to work, and everybody working on a drug believes it's going to work. But the reality is, on the first day, if the first patient gets a new drug, the likelihood of it getting to Walgreens is about less than 10%. And it depends a little bit on the class of drug and a little bit, um, uh, you know, antibodies are a little more, a little more uh, throughput than do small molecules uh, because there are other issues with small molecules that antibodies don't have. But uh, it, it, it's, it is an uphill battle. And I will point out now that in oncology, this is a much bigger a hurdle because there are so many goods, good drugs out there. And so you, you, we no longer can take forward an oncology drug that is active. We have to take forward oncology drugs that are very active because there are very good therapies out there in most circumstances. So in early development, your mindset is de-risk the drug or get rid of it because it has a low probability of success. I've worked on over 100 phase one agents. Many of them get abandoned and for good reason. They don't work right, they don't work well enough, they have other issues, et cetera. So you really need to focus on early development about understanding what is going wrong. Don't assume it's going right. Focus on what's going wrong and what could go wrong. And you should know a good, about, good bit about this from your initial discovery work. You know what your liabilities are. Focus on your liabilities. If, if you guys are bridge players or play hearts and you're planning on shooting the moon, launching that million billion dollar drug, you know you got to get rid of the losers in your hand first. And that's the same in early development. Late development is more focused on 
what the regulators want and what the marketplace wants. You've got a highly active drug, you've got a profile. What, you know, how do I how do I maximize my chance of, of success? And then for inline marketed products, those are indication expansions, and you're looking for other uses of the same chemical map. Um, this slide is courtesy of Steve Paul, who used to head up R&D at Lilly, um, one of the best drug developers I know, uh, a very, very bright, very experienced um, uh, physician scientist. But it gives you an idea of how much in you're going to invest in time. And I know these, these segments change a lot. There's a lot of generalities here, which may not apply to all circumstances. But there is a big investment of, um, of, of time to, to get through this. And you... Problems that you didn't work out in your discovery plays, they're going to play out later in clinical practice or in clinical development. And um, that's a very expensive place to lose. So if you can de-risk your drug to the extent possible in discovery and solve the issues you need to solve in discovery, that's what you want to do. You can't fix it in clinical development. The drug knows what it wants to do. That's all it's going to do figure out its liabilities so that you can focus on those. This is a very expensive business. Um, these are very average costs. They vary tremendously. You've heard you know, how, much, how billions it costs to get a drug to market. And those are based on all kinds of assumptions, which may or may not apply in any one situation. Uh, but suffice it to say, it's an expensive business. Most people don't do phase zero studies, so, but I will say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, your safety and PK phase one studies um, have a very high attrition rate. It's going to cost you a couple million to do. Depends on if you're going to go right into patients, what kind of patients, are, uh, um, and, or are you going to do a normal volunteer study, which is considerably cheaper and faster. A lot of oncology drugs are not suited for normal volunteer studies, but if you can do it, it's always to your advantage because, because of the time and cost savings. You get into phase two, now you're starting to, you, you know, you need some significant backers. Maybe you can get through phase one with friends, family, and fools backing you. Um, um, but by phase by phase two, you're typically, you, you need you need venture capital money, farm money, or some other body, somebody else with deep pockets. And so the story goes. Now, I don't want you to think about drug development as simply um, you know, the Texas two-step. We're going to do the phase one, then we do the phase two, then we do the phase three, then we go to the FDA, and they give you a label, and you've got your drug in for sale. It doesn't really work that way. Because you need to come up with a whole pile of data. And this is just a, 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 a cursory summary of what's in a package insert. These are the questions you're going to have to answer. And you may not be able to answer those in a simple phase one, then a phase two, then a phase three. You may need accessory studies that go in parallel to what you're doing. Maybe you do two phase two studies. Maybe you do two phase three studies, which by the way, the fa two phase three studies, well controlled, are the gold standard. You can get proved with less, but the FDA will often tell you two phase three studies, two tablets. That's what Moses came down from Mount Sinai with, two tablets two phase three studies. So plan on two phase three studies. And then if you've got really fascinating data or someone, something that's really desirable, you, you can get it approved with one. There are unique circumstances, which I'll talk about for rare diseases and other indications. But this, these are the questions you're going to have to answer. So you may have other studies that go along the way. And I'm not going to focus very much on how you deal with abuse liability or drug-drug interactions or some of the other uh, label considerations. Um, but I'm happy to, if you have questions about those, you can, you can email me or we can talk about it later. Now, how do you manage risk? So I don't know if you all remember this show, it's making a comeback, um, it's called Deal or No Deal. But the, the, the concept was you pick a, you wanna pick the million dollar briefcase. And along the way, the bank is gonna make you an offer to buy you out. Um, and what I liked about the show is it really illustrates um, how you manage risk in commercial drug development. Um, you, you don't want to blow all your money on a loser. You want to get out and, uh, or stay in, depending on the appropriate risk. And I, this is a very nice article which illustrates it. The, the numbers aren't so important um, as is the overall concept. 
But the green dots show the value, the net present value of your asset, your drug at various times. And then you have a next step and you have some probability of success and you have some probability of failure. And you're, the, there's a cost to, to take, taking that next step, just as in the deal or no deal, Holly Mandel will tell you there's a cost. You're going to stay in the game and risk some money, or you're going to get out of the game and take what you got. And, and this is a calculation that is made very differently by different companies or even different executives within the same company, um, depending on circumstances. Pfizer was all in with up to $850 million with Trocetropib the day before it failed. It had a 57% probability of success as judged internally. Why would Pfizer spend $850 million on something that's almost a coin flip and then lose? Because for them, that was a good bet. They had the cash and they wanted something to follow Lipitor, um, which was discovered in Ann Arbor, by the way. Um, so, but not everybody's going to make an $850 million bet and lose. Their stock price didn't change, by the way, because it was a very diversified company. They can make those kind of big bets but not everybody's gonna make that kind of bet. Your willingness to take on risk is dependent on your ability to handle the risk. You may say, well, I'll live through the downside. I'm all in. Um, you know, I'm, for those of you who watch the Super Bowl, there are people that bet over a million dollars just on the coin flip. Same thing. Okay, so let's get to the meat and potatoes. So phase zero studies are not done as much um, uh, as the other types of studies. You don't hear about them, but they're really valuable. And they're great studies, particularly to do in an academic situation because they're low cost and they can be very informative. Typically, you're trying to understand something about the biology of the patients or the biology of the drug. And you wanna do this in a small constrained uh, human experiment. Sometimes you can do this in the context of exploratory INDs, which is a, a category which the FDA recognizes. You often do this if you're trying to choose between, see you had three drugs and you weren't sure which one you, you like, you might want to have an exploratory IND where you test all three, and there's some attribute that will allow you to choose. Often these are done at lower, uh, low doses because you have limited uh, toxicology at this point. Um, you can ask, answer questions about the absorbent distribution and metabolism, the so-called ADME. You can look at physiologic effects. Uh, there's a typo here, apologies for that. Um, thought I got all those. Um, and there's some very good examples about how they've been used. I won't, I won't go through them all, but uh, I've provided you some references here. So this is a nice one um, that, that illustrates a, a very simple concept. You typically have a target and you wanna inhibit the target. But in this case, in the upper left, in that bar graph, this is the level of expression of that target. It's all over the map. And so you're, you're a physician looking at it, you're saying, well, what's going on here? You know, the body is really good at controlling things. Your know, serum sodium is in a narrow range. Your hemoglobin's in a narrow range. Everything we, we measure in people is within a narrow range, but this is all over the place. There's some other factor I need to know because you wanna measure your inhibition of this in your phase one study. Well, based on the target itself and, and, and a good guess, um, the folks that designed this experiment, I was involved in this, uh, felt this was due to the presence of food. And so normal volunteers were brought in there. In the lower right, you can see this at 8 a.m. Their fasting levels were measured. Um, and you can see you have very tight um, levels of the, of the target. They got a, a, a Hardy's double cheeseburger with bacon, uh, a high carbohydrate, high fat meal. And you can see that the levels of the target go up and they are um, more constrained. So this is a very important piece of information to know before you do your phase one study where you're giving patients their drug and they may be fed or unfed and you're trying to measure inhibition of the target and your target's not getting inhibited very well because you've just driven the target through the ceiling by because not controlling for, for food intake. There are many examples of phase zero studies, and, uh, but, I, so I won't, but I won't belabor them. So early development in phase one is really uh, where the rubber hits the road. 
So you want to establish the maximum tolerated dose, or more commonly now, the maximum administered dose. And you want to characterize the major safety issues. You have some good idea of this coming out of your animal tox, whether your animal tox is done, say, in a, 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 a rodent and dog, typically mice or rats and beagles. Sometimes they're done in, in non-human primates, although well, those are very expensive and non-human primates are hard to come by. There, there are some types of drugs that can only be done in non-human primates. There are some classes of drugs for which there is no preclinical tox. It can't be done. So if you're genetically modifying uh, autologous cells that you've collected from the patient, there's no point in doing preclinical tox because it's meaningless. And you, you get a pass. Since it's impossible to do it, you get to go right to phase one with uh, your cell product, uh, provided you have met some other uh, important uh, milestones. Uh, typically, you want to assess the pharmacology, the, the Tmax, the, the half-life of your drug, and the overall exposure of the area under the curve. In many cases, you're, you're going to assess metabolites, although sometimes metabolites are done in a separate uh, companion study. For oncology, we really like to see anti-tumor activity. Your future investors or present investors are going to want to see anti-tumor activity. And this is sometimes a really good reason to do your phase one in normal volunteers where you can't see it. Then, then people aren't disappointed because I've done a normal volunteer study of D-risk, it PK, the safety, and uh, but I haven't addressed the efficacy, so you don't take a hit on that. So I like doing normal volunteer studies if I can. Uh, they're faster, they're cheaper. And, and um, you get to, to phase two sooner. This is a, uh, your first opportunity to look at tumor biomarkers, uh, tumor biology, pharmacogenic considerations, and you may or may not incorporate some other special studies, which I'll speak to later. Now, we often talk about phase one and, uh, A and phase one B. Some, uh, they're very often combined, and I'll give you an example of this. Phase one A's are just the first in human, uh, limited exposure, dose escalation, you want to get a, a cursory safety profile, uh, and you, uh, often you, you can use healthy individuals. For phase 2b, they're, they're invariably tested in, in, in phase 1b, they're tested in patients with the indications of interest. Um, and then you go into expansion courts, and I'll give you some examples of that. You're trying to establish a proof of concept that the idea behind your drug is sound and that this is manifest by either very uh, good pharmacodynamic assessment or some clinical outcome. Phase one studies are not for the faint hearted. They are dangerous. They are made safe by people following very careful rules. But there have been in my career, some notable disasters. There are, there are three that occurred uh, early in my career. One was that the first one was at the University of Pennsylvania. Second one occurred in England, um, sort of by a CRO. And the third one occurred at Johns Hopkins um, with an asthma drug. You should read about these drugs. Uh, one, the first one was uh, only transcarbamylase deficiency. The second was a, 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 an antibody against CD28. They misunderstood their preclinical tox. Um, and the Hopkins case was just um, a, just a poor understanding of the of the safety guidelines that needed to be in place, and it actually shut down all clinical research at Hopkins for some time. So you want to be skilled in the art. If you are not skilled in doing phase one studies, you need to have a friend who will help you uh, because you can get into a lot of trouble with uh, a poorly designed or poorly executed phase one study. I will point in, out that the, the first the, the first one of these was a study was approved by the FDA and the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee. The, the, the second one was approved by an IRRB, but didn't go through FDA. And the third one didn't, um, I don't know, only went to the local IRB. It, was, it should have had an IND, but they didn't. Okay, so what about study designs? And I'll spend some time on study designs. Um, so the three plus three is the gold standard. Uh, it's a perfectly good design. It's well suited uh, as a general purpose tool, um, although it has some limitations. In this example, the box is in green. Patients, three, uh, three patients were given each dose. And because they did not have a dose limiting toxicity, which you have to predefine what your dose limiting toxicity is, 
and the FDA will weigh in on what they think about your dose limit. You may say, well, I'm going to exclude this because it's related to the disease. And the FDA may agree to with you. you know, they may tolerate anemia because patients come in and need it, okay? But they may not. So you need to think carefully about what constitutes dose limiting toxicity. But the first nine patients in the study experienced none. And so you went all the way up to 120 milligrams. But then in the first three, in the blue box, at 120 milligrams, there was a DLT. So you went to six. You only saw one out of six, so you kept going. And each of the first three blue boxes, one out of only you there was only one out of six, so you didn't get to a, a, a DLT by the traditional rules. But when you got up to up to 450 milligrams, you got two DLTs, and so you started de-escalating because you saw more. And then you had, you kind of frittered your way down down to 200 milligrams and decided that was your maximum tolerated dose. Very very commonly used design. It's built on some certain assumptions. So in, in the inserted table there, if your DLT rate is 20%, there's a 65% chance you know, um, uh, of going forward and a, about a 30% chance of being stopped. The problem with this is it assumes that the rate of DLTs is, is invariant with dose. And that doesn't really sit well with everyone. Um, because it's more likely to have a dose limiting toxicity as you expose the patient to more drug. So th that this design does not take that into consideration. It's also not very good at defining the DLT, but that may or may not be important depending on your mission, and I'll speak to that in a second. Okay, so 70% of the clinically relevant toxicities found in later studies are described in the prior three plus three phase one study. That is a really powerful statement. And it's why the study design has stood up for so long, because it does ferret out your toxicities. Now, a lot of those other toxicities may show up because they're on the lower part of this slide in the purple box, they, have, they appeared outside your DLT window. You have to define your DLT window. In other words, you're gonna follow those patients, those three patients for a minimum of X weeks, days, months, whatever, until you decide that the, the, it's not likely you'll see another toxicity, even though you're continuing to dose them. So if your toxicity is something that occurs late, it'll be outside your DLT window and it doesn't count to you, but it does count doesn't count for dose escalation, but it does count when you try to figure out your next dose. So that's one of the problems you have with any of these designs. Um, but the point is that three plus three design does effective job of determining your risk and giving you a path forward. As I already mentioned, it, it, it doesn't take into consideration the higher rate of toxicity at higher doses. So this is another variation on design, and this was used for gilteritinib. This was a study that was designed by Urkut Bashishi at Estellas, who Urkut reported to me, and was conducted by Mark Levis at Johns Hopkins. It was a really nice, nicely designed, designed study. So what they did is they knew that they had a very high therapeutic index in their preclinical talks. So they didn't really want to expose a lot of people at low doses. But on the other hand, if they did find a dose that worked, they wanted to get more people at that dose so that they could see if, if that was in, in fact a good dose. So at 20 milligrams, the first patient, it, it, it turns out they were do dosed at Northwestern, um, um, uh, received gilteritinib at a dose that was considered far low, too low to be effective, and they got a CR. So they put another patient on, and then they expanded this, because the rule was, if you got a CR, we'll look at at least 17 patients to see what the CR rate is at that dose. And at 20 milligrams, they had somebody who had a CR, so they expanded that one. But they didn't, but while they were expanding, they're also dose escalating. So not exposing a lot of people to ineffective therapies. They could have skipped all those they wanted and just did, in the green boxes, just done a single patient because there was no toxicity, no significant toxicity. They went on to 400 milligrams and they declared that dose limiting toxicity, all that was barely met the criteria. But the label dose is going to be around 120, okay? So it wasn't really important in this study to really carefully define the dose limiting 
toxicity? What's the maximum tolerated dose? We don't really know. Maybe we could have gone higher in this study. It wasn't really explicitly explored. But we knew that you were way above what you needed to be efficacious because you're seeing complete responses in AML patients all along the way. Now, adaptive designs have became very popular um, in the in 1990s and, and, and beyond, and there have been a lot of versions and iterations on this. I'm going to give you one example, but there are many examples that you have to choose from, and you should pick them based on whether or not they suit your sensibilities, your, your biostatistician wants to, you know, wants to use this design or whatever. So, as I've mentioned, that phase one the dose escalation trials using the three plus disease design have poor performance in actually defining the MTD. If you know you don't care about the MTD, then don't worry about it. But, but if you have a narrow therapeutic index, the MTD might be important to really nail down with some precision. And adaptive design will help you a lot on you. The other thing about adaptive designs is they use all your information. They use all the data from all your cohorts to decide are you continuing, are you not continuing? Not just the information from that goal. Um, it prevents the trial from stopping prematurely due to the chance observation of two out of six DLTs that it's really not a two thirds rate. Your rates are really not that high. It's just that you happen to get the two that were gonna get the toxicity and um, so forth. Uh, for instance, in a clinical trial we were running recently, we had two uh, uh, cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome and a dose escalation. Well, Guillain-Barre syndrome is not a good thing to have, but it's a class effect. And um, because of how the study was designed, we were able to work around that and find out that really Guillain-Barre syndrome is not that common with this drug. Although to look at the data, you'd say, well, 66% of your patients are going to get it. It's not really the case. It's just an odd statistic when you have such a small sample size. So uh, the keyboard design is a, a, a design that, that I particularly like, and we're using it now in a study which will be um, uh, starting um, actually this week or next. Um, but the DLT rate is pre-specified and flexible and changes with dose level. The cohort size is flexible. It can be as little as one. Um, or it can be much larger. And the, and the DLT data from all tested doses are used to determine. It. So what does that look like compared to three plus three? Well, I'm not gonna walk you through this. You can, you can play with this, these graphs on your, on your own, but what you can see is the three plus three design is shown there on the left. And, the, and you can see where you escalate in, e, in green, um, you, you stay if it's yellow um, uh, um, and, and, and so forth. And there's a lot more uh, patients uh, that will be enrolled in your study, but you'll end up with much more precision. So here's an example. So on the left, the three plus three design would take you up to that third dose level. Then you'd see two out of your first three patients got a, uh, experienced um, um, uh, adverse, significant adverse events, and, you'd, and, and you would, you would uh, uh, de-escalate to your prior dose level. If, if the same study run in a keyboard design, you wouldn't have stopped, you would have de-escalated, tested some more patients, increased the power around your observation, and ended up at a higher dose, for example. And you go on and do the math, here's the math. Okay, so this is one of my all-time phase one designs. It's design, designed um, by Mark Myers, who lives over in Jackson County, Michigan. He was working for Park, he's also a Michigan grad, um, uh, worked for Park Davis and later Pfizer um, when they were up on your North Campus. Uh, and this was a, a, a phase one study of a, a MAP kinase inhibitor. And Mark had run MAP kinase inhibitor studies before, so he had a lot of information about how they behave, and he had a lot of tools at his disposal. But what was nice about the study design, it was an incredibly comprehensive study design that incorporated pretty much everything he needed to know to get through phase two in one study. So it was dose escalation, it, it, it was schedule changes, from once a day to twice a day to thrice a day. Um, there was a food effect because um, it's an oral, orally administered drug. He assessed the modulation of the target. 
He says he had a pharmacologic pharmacodynamic assessment with a KI-67 staining to look at um, tumor cell proliferation and looked at clinical response. So very, very dense study design. And he actually won a big award for this. And you can see in his early cohorts, he was the Q-day dosing, then he went to BID dosing in nine through 11. And then in by cohort 12, he was going BID dosing, but he had there were weekends off. And this is just another view of the data as he was seeing it in real time. You know, you can see the number of pa patients treated each dose and schedule and the number of DLTs he observed and so forth. Beautiful PK data. Oops, sorry. And very nice pharmacodynamic data. Changes in Burke phosphorylation um, uh, are, sh are shown on the top and changes in KI-67 are, are, are shown, shown on the bottom. All of this provides you with just very rich data set to say that you're on the right path. No surprise here because Mark had previously worked on another drug called CI-1040, which had poor bioavailability. And Mark was able to pressure test and road test all of these tools he had developed along the way. So very elegant study. Okay, let's go to phase two. The primary goal there is to establish that there is sufficient efficacy to warrant further investment. You don't want to expose a lot of patients to drug that doesn't work, but you're going to have to expose a lot more patients to figure out if it does work. And quite often here, you're going to have to have some interim stopping rule, either assignment two stage design or some other device that will um, be re uh, reviewed, most typically by your independent data safety monitoring committee that will tell you that it's safe to proceed. And you'll set up the rules for those in advance. The major considerations set out this study is your, your efficacy endpoint, which we'll stop, I'll talk about later, the population you want. Do you want all cancer patients or you just want this one kind of cancer patient? What's the study design? We'll come to that in a minute. And how, what's the size of your study? How are you powering your study? Um, is this go big or stay home? Or is this a pretty big study because you're, you, you know what the competitor looks like and you're gonna have to beat their benchmark? The most important thing to think about in your phase two study design is you're using your phase one data to guess what your phase three study is, okay? So you got your phase one data in hand and you're imagining a reg your registrational study. You have to do that imagination. It's extremely important because your phase two study needs to de-risk your phase three. You can do a lot of phase two studies, but if they don't de-risk your phase three study, you're spending a lot of money at risk with phase three. You haven't removed risk but you're asking for a whole lot of dollars. And most of the time that combination doesn't go work well. Now, sometimes you skip phase two. Lily famously skipped phase two with solanezumab and, um, and one of their other Alzheimer's drugs because they argued that the phase two study would be just as expensive as the phase three. So they'll just put stopping rules into the phase three study. Uh, and, they, and, they, and, and they used their biomarker data from the phase one studies and went directly into phase three, spent a ton of money, blew it up, didn't work. Well, if you have the kind of cash, more power to you. It's important to understand the relationship the phase two endpoint and the phase three endpoint. You have to explicitly know that. And I'll, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. You, you might want to use response rate because it's relatively easy to get and it comes up on CT scan uh, for tip, most solid tumors or whatever your typical clinical measures are. Um, but that's not a good endpoint for approval. Overall survival is, and you need to understand the linkage between response rate and overall survival. Probably not a lot of linkage from low-grade lymphomas. If you're going after follicular lymphoma and you're using response rate and you're going to launch your phase three study up for response rate data, probably not a good idea because a lot of things respond, but they don't necessarily um, mean you, you improve overall survival in that setting. Now, in some settings, that might, you, you, that might be acceptable. Your phase two study may be different than phase one, but it can't be too different than your anticipated phase three. And this is often a mistake. Okay, your phase three 
phase two study might be an operant population, but now you're just going to focus on, um, on, on the disease of interest, say renal cell cancer, or whatever. Um, that's fine, but it, but you need to approximate what you're going to do in phase in phase three. Um, your, your maximum tolerated dose and your recommended phase two dose from phase one may not be the ultimate approved dose and schedule. And you need to keep that in mind. And increasingly, the FDA, under what's called Project Optimus, is asking for more dose ranging. So you're going to have to decide where you're going to do your dose ranging. Are you going to do it in your phase two? Are you going to build it in your phase three? Are you going to just plow ahead with this dose that you think is the right dose? And then have a separate study to address dose ranging separately. For example, when odansetron was, um, was being developed for nausea associated with chemotherapy, everyone knew the drug worked, but nobody knew the right drug. I mean, sorry, nobody knew the right dose. I mean, how do you know you weren't going too hot? When I was a fellow at Michigan, we, did a, we participated in the study, which looked how low could you go and still prevent nausea with platinum induced nausea and vomit. So you have to decide where you're going to do that. Maybe here, maybe later. Um, other points I'll come to later. A few other considerations, um, uh, which I'll just briefly touch on. You need to determine your effect size. Uh, I mean, what effect size is going to be important? And this is one of the most difficult calculations you're going to have to make. Uh, and you, um, you probably need a control arm. So I would start with the assumption you need a control arm and then convince yourself that you don't. Um, most phase two studies are better served with, a, with an appropriate control arm, makes the data much more interpretable. And then any biomarkers you want to use later on, you better road test them in your phase two study. Don't try to introduce um, them uh, later than phase two. There are a zillion designs here. I won't go through them, they're kind of self-explanatory, um, but I will illustrate some of these later. The design should fit the question you're trying to answer. And the question you're trying to answer in phase two is, what is my biggest risk right now? Is your biggest risk safety? Is your biggest risk, does it work? What is your biggest risk? And make sure the design is appropriate for your biggest risk. Then ask yourself, what's my next biggest risk? And have I covered that? And so forth. Often people end up with phase two designs that are not appropriate for their risk. And I'll give you an example. But before I do that, I want to give you a cool study. I love this study. Uh, this was um, a phase two study of Everolimus in uh, metastatic urethral cancer. Single arm, non, uh, single arm phase two, non-randomized, all patients got the drug. And, and this is done at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and, and I won't, you can read the slide. But the bottom line is here, Everolimus did not meet its primary endpoint. That's what their publication says. But wait, David Sullivan made the interesting observation that this one patient had this really cool response. And he decided to ferret out, why did she have this response? And so she under, he undertook whole genome sequencing and it, and identified mutations, in, somatic mutations in this person's tumor, which gave this patient unique sensitivity to the drug and it likely accounted for why she responded. Now, this didn't go on to result in Everolimus being approved for urothelial cell carcinoma, but it is important to sometimes pursue these side adventures because you will find the right population for your drug. A good example is when Olympta got approved, uh, it was studied in non-small cell lung cancer writ large, but it was approved for non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer because there was a pre-specified, pre-specified analysis by histotype. And that's how the drug got approved. Had that not been done, no approval. Okay, phase three confirms your prior positive results in a larger population, um, and it should be representative of those who will get the drug if approved. And I say this because the FDA is gonna look at this. If you wanna go run your study someplace else, not in the US of A, you need to convince the FDA that those patients are for all intents and purposes equivalent. And they have to be equivalent in terms of their biology, their genetics, 
and also the standards of care in which the community operates. It's very important. Phase three gives you a much more refined effect size. That's the point of phase three. You already know it works coming out of phase two, but you, you're going to be able to have very narrow error bars on that. Your events rates are your, your adverse event rates are nailed down. Uh, you're going to have a comparator, either the active comparator or placebo. You can get approved in single arm studies without a comparator. I'll speak to that later. These are often multinational in scope and they will be reviewed minimally by the FDA, the EMEA, the SFDA in China, and PMDA um, uh, in Japan. Um, and you're going to get feedback from them before starting your study. Listen to their feedback. Don't ignore their feedback. They will let you do stupid things as long as it's not harmful, but it may not be good for your future. I'll give an example. The final thing is you need to understand where you're going to place this. This is prostate cancer. There's a lot of things in prostate cancer. Where am I going with my drug? Is it after cabazitaxel or is it right after surgery? Who knows? You have to decide how you're going to position that based on the sum, top, sum total of the, your knowledge to date, your pocketbook, and, and what study designs are available to you. Um, Endpoints are really important. Um, they need to be both cl cl clinically and statistically meaningful. This is often a compromise between competing constraints. I mean, obviously overall survival is the gold standard in oncology, but many drugs get approved without it, but be careful if you're using that approach. You wanna negotiate these endpoints with FDA, EMA, and PMDA. There are several, many studies that are done and labeled differently in the US and Europe simply because the endpoint doesn't, isn't palatable in, in another jurisdiction. Um, the acceptance of your endpoint is driven not only by does it make sense, but also how big is the effect. The FDA may not really want to give you approval on overall response rate, but if you have if you're doing a non-small cell lung cancer study and you've got a 75% CR rate in the first six months of treatment, I'll bet dollars to donuts you're gonna get a label and accelerate approval, okay, without the OS data, because that's just pretty incredible. And experience would say that doesn't happen very often. So it's the size that, ma that matters here, not just the input. I won't go through this in detail. Hopefully you know this. If you don't, you can read through this or read up on it. But overall response rate is the categorical gold standard. It is clinically meaningful. I'm sorry. It is not clinically meaningful. It's, 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 a, it's not, a patient doesn't experience responding. Now, unless they have, you know, some particular symptom, like it's pressing on their sciatic nerve and their leg hurts, okay? And then the tumor shrinks and their leg doesn't hurt, okay? But that won't get you approval. Progression-free survival is another surrogate endpoint for, for clinical benefit, but overall survival is the gold standard. When you're going for approval, particularly in um, XUS, you want to focus on also things like quality of life, cost of the therapy, various patient-reported outcomes, and in some cases, special um, events, that things like minimal residual disease assessment can help you with your approval and subsequent marketing. So understanding the relationship of these is, 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 is important. PFS and ORR, time to tumor progression, are not efficacy endpoints. They're not clinical. It's not showing the drug is clinically meaningful, okay? It's showing that, um, that it's biologically active, but it doesn't measure how the patient feels, function, or survives. And that is what your regulatory authority is looking at. They may allow you to use this as a surrogate, and they often do. And there's a lot of variation in their temperament on this, in my experience. And I'll give you some examples. A statistically significant PFS alone is insufficient to establish clinical benefit. So I'm going to go on about this. I won't go over patient selection. You can read over that on your own. These are some examples of drugs that that stumbled along the way. I'll skip those in the interest of time. I want to show you this one example of a classic failure. It's a phase one, phase two, three study. 
that bombed because they had a four phase two design. And the four phase two design did not set up their phase three design. And in their phase three design, they had a crossover, which basically neutralized the benefit there they were seeing prior crossover. Bad choice. Uh, PFS looks great, it's the curve separated, but the FDA said, well, your control arm is better than your experimental arm, you're not getting an approval. What happens next? They didn't approve it because they didn't like the comparator, they didn't like the crosser, they didn't accept it. The, the sponsor's explanation of the events. Estelle, for whom I worked at the time, dropped their collaboration with Aveo. Share price fell, shareholders sued, SEC came in and sued everybody. And the SEC won. They said the, the company did not keep their investors surprised, withheld information, and people lost their privilege to operate in this space. I was the an expert witness for the SEC in this case. It did get improved in Europe, surprisingly, although pundits have later commented that probably shouldn't have been improved in Europe because the data package was really too slim. I'm going to slip over, skip over this in the interest of time because I think you can just read those slides and they're pretty self-apparent to a sophisticated audience like this. I do want to alert you to the difference between LDTs and FDA cleared tests. The FDA is putting a lot of pressure on laboratory developed tests and wanting to move more toward uh, um, FDA clear tests. The FDA has not been consistent on this in the past and has approved drug with LDTs, but their preference is that any test that's being used to select a patient for therapy or to keep a patient from getting the therapy um, should be cleared by the FDA and in consultation with their CDRH division. Avoid post hoc data mining. It's a waste of time. It never goes anywhere. Sometimes you can figure something out, but most of the time you're kidding yourself. Come up with a hypothesis and test your hypothesis. As, as Adam Feuerstein said, our drug didn't prolong survival compared to placebo, except in the subset of left-handed patients who ate meat low three days prior to enrolling. You can always find a subset of what works, but, you, but it doesn't mean it's meaningful. And this table shows within the number of things you're testing, your error rate goes up quite steeply. And this drug was recently approved in ovarian cancer. It's a good example of this. They, reach, they had a cutoff for the folate receptor alpha at 50%. The, the data looked great, but the subset of patients who had 75% did even better. But that's not good for approval because they didn't pre-specify it, wasn't alpha protected appropriately controlled. So they had to redo the study with a new population of patients. There were only 75% level expression. And they did get a nice label. Rare diseases have their own considerations and they're difficult. Um, we could spend a lot of time on rare diseases and I, and I particularly like this area. The first thing to recognize is the natural history study may be needed. Um, the, the, there may be too little known of, about the natural history of your favorite disease, say unstable hemoglobin, for the FDA to have opinion on what's a clinical benefit. Um, and, and if there is a clinical benefit, how am I measuring it? And I'll give you an example. Now, how you're going to recruit this uh, can be quite difficult with rare diseases. Um, um, you might have to go to a cooperative group or patient advocacy groups, and the latter can be extremely helpful. You need to be aware of heterogeneity within your rare disease, and I'll give you an example. And the FDA has a lot of guidance on this, and they can help you ton. So here's an example of, of uh, a drug that was developed by Agilis. Um, It was originally made, I think, as a cancer drug, but worked well in pyruvate kinase deficiency. It's a rare, it's a rare disorder. The initial study was a natural history study, which preceded any drug study. And this was, and 40% of those patients was were accrued at the Central Pennsylvania Clinic. I said I'm, the, I'm one of the founders, and I said I'm their board of directors. Um, uh, and they accrued uh, a lot of the patients because the Central Pennsylvania Clinic caters to um, old order Amish individuals, and they have um, pyruvate kinase deficiency quite commonly, particularly in the Amish that live in Central Pennsylvania. And so it's a good place to do your study. You can get a lot of patients pretty quickly. This, the drug was approved on two studies, so not a lot of patients. But look at the look at the um, the outcome measure. They didn't use overall survival here. 
they used uh, they, they defined a response, a categorical response, yes or no, of a 1.5 grams per deciliter or greater increase in hemoglobin. So if you're 1.4, you weren't a responder. And if you were 1.5 or 1.51, you were a responder. Okay, so that was negotiated with the agency in advance. They also did another study in people who were transfusion dependent and looked at the decrement in transfusion, another negotiated endpoint. Okay, not PFS, not OS, not response rate but these are custom made for this indication. Interestingly, the Amish patients that participated in the phase in, in the natural history study don't respond at all to this drug because their mutation that causes thyroid kinase kind of deficiency prevents them from responding to the drug, whereas the mutations that many other people have are responsive. So this is an example of a rare disease where the subset of a subset doesn't work. So you need to understand these rare diseases at the subatomic particle level or better. And this just shows the rise in hemoglobin for this trade. So we're getting near the end of time. And I know I've gone through this very quickly, but I want to end with pointing out that the FDA, the PMDA in Japan, and the European medicine agencies are great resources for helping you get it right. And you will meet with them regularly. And so this graphic shows the typical interactions over the life cycle of your drug, leading to drug approval that you'll have with the FDA. EMA is a little different, but it, it's, it's pretty close. Uh, so you can have a variety of what are called interact meetings for non-clinical safety issues that support your first in human um, um, study. And then you may or may not choose to have a pre-IND meeting with the FDA so they can opine on this. Uh, if you have significant risk or you're new to the business, you want to do this because if they find errors in your design or things they don't like, you go on clinical hold and the clock can run forever because they are under no obligation to take you off clinical hold within a certain period of time. The FDA does have a clock for most of the things that will give you uh, that you ask them for. So they will be responsive in a certain period of time, but do not end up in clinical hold because you're stuck until you get it resolved. Um, often you meet at the end of phase one uh, to discuss your next plans. Someplace in the middle of here, you're going to have to come up with a pediatric plan. At the end of phase two, you're going to discuss your phase two data and your phase three design. Um, and when you have your phase three data, you're going to have a pre- uh, uh, new drug application or uh, biologics application meeting with them. And then you, then there's the review that goes on of your application for approval, may or may not go to the oncology uh, advisory committee. And then all along the way, shown in purple, they're looking at your safety reports and maybe coming back to you with questions about things that show up along the way. So there's a lot of guidance given by the FDA and the EMEA. A lot of this is published in advance. And there are a lot of people in industry that are more than happy to help you for free if you just ask. Don't get stuck doing this by yourself. There's a lot of people out there. All right, we're at the top of the hour. And I know I've gone very fast and covered probably far too much material. But I do want to tell you this is a really cool book you should get and read if you like this topic. This is an exquisitely readable book and lots of really good examples. So thank you all very much. This is where my sidewalk ends. Okay. I will second Peter's comment there and thank you, Stephen, very much for that lecture. That was fantastic. Um, Looks like there are a few participants on the call. Where th was there anything pressing that anybody wanted to ask Stephen? Um, if you have the time, Stephen, I want to be respectful of. of sure, your... no, I have plenty of time. Okay. Are there any questions? Well, I, I gave you my email, so if you think you have any questions, you can email me later, or if you just want free advice, I'm always available. I do a lot of consulting for free because it's more fun when it's free. Um, so um, I, this, this industry has been very good to me and I'm very happy to share everything I know with anybody who wants to know. So uh, don't don't be shy. If you're working on some project and, and you want some free advice, I'm happy to 
give you several hours of time for nothing. And that's very generous of you. And I'm not yeah. sure you can see it or not, Stephen, but there are several that are just commenting that it was a fantastic talk and thanking you again. Well, thank you guys. Okay. okay. Thanks very much.